All right. Thank you guys for being here. Um, it's been a good week so far. I hope it's been a good week for you. Uh, I talked to Jonathan today. He's real excited about coming. I actually, uh, I found today that was, I was, I got to find, I may empty that box up there, but I was given some blankets, scarves, hats, gloves, a bunch of stuff that they had come through clothes closet. They were, they were trying to sort it. I said, don't sort it. We'll give it to him. So uh, we're going to give him that and the socks that we had had for a while. He's excited to be with us. He looks forward to being here. I told him today, I said, you will be a staple for our, for our missions month. You'll be here every October on some Sunday. We'll get with you. So, uh, but we're excited for what's going on. Great Sunday. Sunday this Sunday was great. A great day. So, um, I know there's a lot of things going on in our church, a lot of things going on with our people. Um, I, I, I'm sure this is okay to announce, but I don't know if all of you are aware that Miss Jean just got custody of her three grandchildren last night. And two of them have autism. So, her plate is really full. <laughs> that may be where she's at tonight, trying to get things settled. I mean, it was a call from Defects, and it was like, you take them or they're going. And so it's like, you know, no, I'm their grandmother. So she's going to need help, you know. And she's got it. People have already stepped up and said they would help her. And so, but we need to just pray for her. And one thing that I told her and I encouraged her with, I said, Miss Jean, one thing we can look at, those kids will be in church every weekend. So that's, that's a big plus. So uh, don't know how they'll do downstairs. We'll have to just play that by ear. Um, so, um, you know, but she's excited and scared to death. And I can imagine. I mean, because this is something you, you, know, you don't expect. But... <clears throat> um, I know, I don't know if y'all know Robin's son, Josh, um, uh, but Josh and Jennifer, they, they were here for, a, a, they got two little girls, they were here for a while, they had to move away, job related, Josh has been through some things in his life, and uh, yesterday he was at his brother-in-law, his brother-in-law's house, they were trying to get this mule donkey that they're trying to get rid of into the barn, and they flipped over the gator, and Josh broke his leg and had to have surgery today on it, or his, or his ankle. Oh, I forgot. Um, uh, and, uh, well, first he said he broke his ankle. Then I found out from my sister that he actually either broke several bones in the ankle. They got to do surgery today. They're trying to, but, um, and right now he's out of work. So, just, well, yeah, he just, he just got a, he was going to orientation for a new job, so just pray for them, um, and uh, I know there's other needs in our church, so let's stand, let's pray, and let's get ready to worship. Father, we're thankful today for your grace, for your mercy. we thankful, God, that you, that we could call upon your name and you hear us. Lord, we pray over every need of this house. We lift up Jean. And her situation that, that, that is, fell in her lap. But Lord, you have probably ordained this. I, I think that your hand is in this for the benefit of these children. And God, strengthen her, encourage her. Lord, supply every need that she needs that needs to be met for her. Lord, we lift up Josh and Jennifer and their family. Lord, we ask you to move in a powerful, powerful way. Um, Lord, touch this, this ankle, leg, whichever one it could be, Lord, that the surgery will be successful and that, Lord, he will get the covers and, and, and with no issues, no problems. Father, we're so thankful, so grateful for all that you do. Be with us as we worship. Speak to us through your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. to offer The here and gone that leaves you wanting more 
but can't satisfy. Father, forgive me for taking so long to see that you're all I need. With every
Once has he ever let go? Now once did he ever stop proving our God is in control? Thank you, Lord. Yeah, give him praise. He is worthy. He is so worthy. Thank you, Lord. You may be seated if you want to, or you can stand the whole time. It's your call. Um, today around 2.20, there was an emergency alert that went out, and everybody was panicking. Everybody was overreacting everybody they were telling people that oh if you even if you turn your phone off it's still going to go as soon as it went off i was getting my truck service as soon as it went off i just hit it and it went away right. it, and now, you know the guy beside me he's like oh that's and we both just it, and it stopped people are overreacting about things i put on facebook i said listen they do this about every three years if jesus wants to alert us He'll alert us. That's when we need to pay attention. That's when we need to focus on. Wait for his signal. Wait for, wait for the trumpet. That'll be a good alert. <laughs> then we'll be out of here. We'll have to worry about no more emergency broadcast things or whatever. And it, it says on there, this is only a test. <laughs> it was all over the place they were going to do it. But <clears throat> I don't know. The... <laughs> should, have, should have videoed that one. That was good. <laughs> should have had that on video. We could have put that on the screen. But, uh, it, but the, the, the problem that, that you have with those things is there's people out there that name themselves prophets, so they'll use that stuff to put fear into people. That's all it is, the fear tactic. Listen, if it's time for an alert, Jesus will alert us. Amen. All right, Acts chapter 12. Um, stand with me. We're going to read about, um, eh, I don't know how far we're going to read. We'll, we'll see how far we go. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some of who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, int intending after, after them. So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Now when Herod was about to bring him out, on the very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two, bound with two, and behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him, and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up, saying, Get up. And the angel said to him, Dress yourself, put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, Wrap your cloak around. And he went out and followed him. He did not know that he was what was being done by the angel, but the angel was real. But, but thought he was see, seeing. What happened? I thought so. What verse is that? Hold on. 
Huh? Thought he saw a vision. And then when, he, when they passed the first and the second guard, they came into the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which opened. Hold on. When they passed the first and second guards, they came to the iron gate leading to the city, which opened to them by itself. And they went out and went forward one, one street, and immediately the angel left. When Peter come to himself, he said, Now I certainly know that the Lord has sent his angel and delivered me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. Verse 12, realizing this, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose, name, whose other name was Mark. And when, they, when, when, and, ga- and when we were gathered together praying, as Peter knocked at the door the, of the porch, a servant girl named Rhoda came to, the, came to, to answer. When she realized, recognized Peter's voice, from the joy she did, not open the door, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the door. They said to her, you are insane. That sounds like a bunch of church folks, don't it? But she insisted that it was very so, it was really so, so they said it is his angel. You may be seated. We went through verse 16. We'll see how far we get. Um, sorry for all the mess up. I don't know what's going on with that thing, but we'll, we'll figure it out. This thing, the heading of, of some of this stuff that I find, it says, wake up to a miracle. Imagine waking up to a miracle and having an angel for your alarm clock. Imagine you're dead and asleep, and all of a sudden you get this, you get woke up by somebody poking you in the side, and you look, and it's an angel, and he says, "Get up." Do we just go, "Oh my God, what's happening?" Or do we get up? I, you know, I don't know, but it just just think about it for a minute. That's what happened to Peter when he was in prison for the third time, awaiting trial and his certain death. Years later, when he wrote his first epistle, Peter may have had this miraculous experience in mind when he quoted Psalms 34, 15 through 16. It says, For the eye of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Can we go, can we get a big old banner and put that at the White House? I mean, uh, up in Washington somewhere? Who? Who? Yeah, yeah, the retirement home up there. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and the ears are open unto their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. That quotation certainly summarizes what God did for Peter, and it reveals to us three wonderful assurances to encourage us in our difficult days of life. Encouragement number one, God sees our trials. This is going to be taken from verses 1 through 4 of what we just read. Acts 12, 1 through 4. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. 1 Peter 3, 12, that's what that is. But this is going to, we're taking, huh? Who? Trials. Our trials. See, God watched and he noted what Herod Agrippa I was doing to his people. This evil man was the grandson of Herod the Great who ordered the Bethlehem children to be murdered. And he was the nephew of Herod Adipus who had John the Baptist beheaded. A scheming and murderous family, the Herods, were despised by the Jews who resented having Edomites ruling over them. Of course, Herod knew this. So he persecuted the church to convince the Jewish people of his loyalty to the traditions of their fathers. Now, this family is evil. They're corrupt. From the father to the son to the grandson. Now that that the Gentiles were openly a part of the church, Herod's plan now was more agreeable, was even more agreeable to the nationalistic Jews who had no place for pagans. Herod did not care about the Jews, but he wanted them to think he did. So how else are you going to get the attention of the Jews when the Jews don't like the Christians but to come against the Christians, right? 
it, 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 it's not the same, but it kind of reminds me of a lot of what's going on in our nation today. A lot of the stuff that I read in Scripture, a lot of the things I find in Scripture, not, not just in Revelation, but all throughout, even in Old Testament, you can see bits and pieces of how things have come together. We need to understand something before we go anywhere. Nothing that's taking place is surprising God. He's aware of every bit of it. I know there are people out there that, that want to make America the, the best thing in the world. And I, I love our nation. I love this nation. We still are a free nation to a certain extent. They're trying to take it. And I'm not getting, getting political, but I just... When I read Revelations and I study Revelations, when it talks about the end, America is not even a national power. The great bear is Russia. The dragon is China. Then you got Turkey or what are some of the other nations. America's, huh? Asia Minor, right. The old, the, the, the America, and, and I'm not saying that we're going to be crippled, but what's taking place in our nation right now is God's aware of it. He sees it. This, this stuff like this reminds me that now there, there's somebody that wants to get in favor with a certain group of people, no matter what the Christians think. See what I'm saying? This is the same thing Herod was doing. He was taking out the church so the Jews could be content. There's people now that want to, I don't care what the Christians think, we're going to go along with you because you are going to outdo them when it comes to what I need. Herod had several believers arrested. One of them was James, the brother of John, whom he beheaded. James became the first of the apostles to be martyred. When you ponder his death in the light of Matthew chapter 20, can you go there? You have a translation? To Matthew 20? If not, I can flip there real quick. Huh? Uh, 20? 20, 20 through 28. Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons worshiping him and desiring a certain thing. Of, it's not doing it. And he said to her, what will you? She said to him, grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on, the, on your right hand and the other on your left hand in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, you, you know not what you ask. Are you able to drink of the cup that I shall drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They, they say to him, we are able. And he said to them, you shall drink indeed of my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left hand is not mine to give, but it shall be given to them for whom it is the prepared of my father. And when the ten heard it, they were moved with indignation against the two brothers. But Jesus called them to, himself, to him and said, you know that the prince... Princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority on them. Is that 28? But it shall not be so among you, but whoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whoever be, will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came to be ministered to, but to minister and to as the Son of Man came not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus right there kind of foretold them that they're going to come against you guys. They're going to, they're going to retaliate. They're going to come against you. So here it is. Maybe, maybe he was pondering the, you know, this, this, this incident in his heart. It, it, takes a, it takes on special significance. James and John were with their mother and, asked, and had asked for thrones, but Jesus made it clear that, that there can be no glory apart from suffering. There can be no glory apart from suffering. He says, are you able to drink of the cup I shall drink of and be baptized with the baptism I baptize with? 
He asked them in, in verse 22, and their bold reply was, yes, we're able. But of course, they did not know what they were saying. But then when they eventually discovered the high cost of winning the throne of glory, James was arrested and killed, and John became an exile on the Isle of Patmos, a prisoner of Rome. Indeed, they did drink of the cup and share in the baptism of, su of, the, of suffering that their Lord had experienced. I have a book in my office called The Book of the Martyrs, and it gives a, a description of every, dis every disciple or apostle that was killed. And I, I forget, James was beheaded. We, we know that here. Um, some of the deaths of, were brutal. Philip was filleted alive. Um, of course, John was, they tried to, tried to kill him. They put him in a boiling pot of oil. He didn't die. So they stuck him on an island and said, well, he'll just die of old age. Instead, he wrote Revelation. <laughs> don't, don't, don't put God's people somewhere by themselves where they have nothing, nothing but to spend time with God. So they experienced this. They, they, they got it. They finally understood what he was talking about. See, if it pleased the Jews when James was killed, just think of how delighted they would be if Peter was killed. James, the half-brother, was John's brother. Yes, we understand that. It's not the same. But if he, he I'm not saying he was insignificant, but Peter, Peter had a voice. Peter was well-known. So if James, if they, these people were just thrilled that James was dead, man, if we kill Peter, look, what's going, look how they're going to react. So God permitted Herod to arrest him and put him under heavy guard in prison. So the plan's coming to pass. It's, it's working, right? Peter's arrested. He's locked up. He's being watched. Sixteen soldiers, four for each watch, kept guard over the apostle with two soldiers chained to the prisoner and two watching the door. They don't want this man to get away. Obviously, there's an APB out on him, and we got him. We, we captured him. They had 16 soldiers watching. Two, they, they, kept, they kept over. Two of them were chained to him. And then they had two watching the doors. After all, the last time Peter was arrested, he mysteriously got out of jail, and Herod was not about to let that happen again. No, can't do that. Huh? So we thought. So why James was allowed to die while Peter was, why was James allowed to die while Peter was rescued? After both were dedicated servants of God needed by the church. The only answer is the sovereign will of God. The very thing that Peter and the church had prayed about after their second experience of persecution in Acts 4 that we've already, we've already covered through that. Herod had stretched forth his hand to destroy the, the church, but God would stretch forth his hand to perform signs and wonders and glorify his son. See, God allowed Herod to kill James, but he kept him from harming Peter. It was the throne in heaven that was in control and not the throne on earth. Let me say that again. It was the throne in heaven that was in control, not the throne on earth. Today, I, I kind of summed up on Wednesday the word talking about the will of God. And then last week, I covered the perfect will of God, which is salvation. The, God's will is for all men to come to repentance. That's the perfect will of God. The perfect will of God is the desire of God for us to, for, for the best for our life and that we succeed. But there's also a will of God called the permissive will of God, which is why things happen around us. Why was James killed? Because God permitted it. It was God's permissive will. In order for something else to take place that he desired. It's not that he didn't love James. It's not that he didn't want James around. But how else would James have died if God didn't allow it to happen? 
And it says here, the question I asked was, why was James allowed to die when Peter was rescued? <clears throat> we don't understand it. But as, as, it just, as we just said at the end of this, God was in control and not man. See, please, you, have to, you, get, you got to understand this. Jerusalem did not replace James as they had replaced Judas. As long as the gospel was going to the Jew first, it was necessary to have the full complement of 12 apostles to witness to the 12 tribes of Israel. The stoning of Stephen ended that special witness to Israel, so the number of official witnesses was no longer important. They immediately replaced Judas when he hung himself, but they chose Matthias, which God wanted it to be Paul. We already covered that, remember? But now, since the gospel was going to the Jew first, they didn't need the full compliment. They didn't need the full compliment. It's good to know that no matter how difficult the trials are or how disappointing the news is, God is still on the throne and has every thing under control see we may not always understand his ways but we know that his sovereign will is best i may it may not line up with what i think is right but it's not about what i think i i know we say this and, and i know we it was said probably i don't know how many times in 2020 that god was still in control that God still is on the throne. And the thing about the, the big uproar with the election and all that stuff that took place and wherever you stand on that, that's, that's you and you. You know, I have my thoughts on it and sometimes I just keep those un, under, under wrap, at least from behind the pulpit. Well, I'm not behind the pulpit. I'm over here in front of Steve. I still keep them to myself. No matter where you stand on how you feel on that, The thing about it is, is anybody that's get put in office in any, any position can be put out of office if the right things are taking place. But nobody can remove God from the throne because nobody put God on the throne. He put himself there. So therefore, nobody can remove him. When, I, when, when all this, when all 2020 was said and done, God was still right where he was when it started. In control. Of the whole situation. So the first thing you got to know is that he sees your trials. He understood what was going on. Listen, we, we just said Peter, this was the third time he was arrested. Paul wrote most of the New Testament, right? From where? Prison. Every, just about everything he wrote when he was in jail. And we, we found out earlier when he was doing in Acts that the king told, the rulers told the, the, the apostles, don't preach in the temple. They got out of jail and where'd they go? To the temple. And that's where Peter made the statement. We must obey God than rather obey man. If it costs us jail time, well, we go back to jail. But now at this point, Peter didn't really understand if his life was going to end in a prison cell. So God sees your trials. The next thing we can talk about is God hears our prayers. And his ears are open unto their prayers, 1 Peter 3, 12. The phrase, but prayer, is a turning point in the story. Never underestimate the power of a praying church. Say it again. Never underestimate the power of a praying church. I told some folks Sunday, I don't know if I said it during my, or, or I didn't say it, I don't know if I said it before service or during service, but a prayerless church is a powerless church. <coughs> okay, we believe that? Okay, who's the church? So prayerless people are powerless people. I, I've, done, I've done a teaching uh, Tuesday, and I'll probably do it again tomorrow when I go about being the church. See, most people say, oh, the church, and they, they think about New Life Assembly at 1630 Zebulon Road. 
Uh-uh. It's the name of this building. This building ain't the church. It's a house of worship. With a church. With a church. So if it's a prayerless church, it's a powerless church, that means the people in that building are prayerless. Prayerless equals powerless. So here he is. Never underestimate the power of a praying church. The angel fetched Peter out of prison. Um, There was a a Puritan named Thomas Watson. He said, but it was prayer that fetched the angel. Well, I like that. (laughs) The angel got Peter, but it was prayer that got the angel. God may come through to you, but somewhere somebody prayed to God. Amen? So we need to follow the scenes in this, in this, in this story in Acts 12. First of all, verses 5 and 6, Peter was sleeping. If you were chained to two Roman soldiers and facing the possibility of being executed the next day, would you f- sleep very soundly? He was sound asleep. The angel just didn't walk in and say, Peter, he had to punch him. He had to nudge him. Peter's out. He's, he's like, oh, man, this floor's uncomfortable, but I'm tired. He's chained to two Roman soldiers. I don't think we would be soundly sleeping, but Peter was. And in fact, Peter was so asleep that the angel had to strike him on the side to even wake him up. That's good, Debbie. He was at peace. Wow. Or maybe he's just a heavy sleeper. I don't know. (laughs) But either way, if he had the peace of God in his life, he he wasn't worried because Peter understood, well, if this is the end, I know where I'm going. I don't know if that was his mentality. I'm, I'm sure it was. It doesn't record that. But just imagine he's there's two soldiers, they're chained together, he's sound asleep. The fact that Peter had been a prisoner twice before is not what gave him his calm heart. It wasn't like, oh, I've been here before. I've done, you know, this ain't nothing. See, for that matter, the, this prison experience was different than the other two. See, this time he was alone, and the difference did not come right away. The deliverance didn't come right away, the other, away like the other, the other, two, other two times. See, he was able to witness. He had others around him. This time, he's alone by himself. But this time, there was no special witnessing opportunities because nobody was with him. Peter's previous arrest had taken place after great victories. But this one followed the death of James, one of theirs. His dear friend and his colleague, it's a new situation altogether. This, this prison sentence, this time, is totally different than what he had experienced before. He was with the disciples when they got arrested. Then he was with other people, able to preach the gospel, able to witness. Now he's chained to two guards. James has been killed. The whole situation is different. This time, it's been probably said, certainly you're going to be tried and killed. This is it. Three strikes and you're out, right? So, what does Peter do? Falls asleep. He just says, I'm going to sleep. So, and, and Debbie has not seen my notes. Have you seen my notes? But the next topic, what gave Peter such great confidence and peace? <laughs> Why, how, how else could you sleep in that situation if you didn't have the peace of God and you wasn't confident? Now, Peter understood the last two times God got him out. So maybe in the back of his mind, he's thinking, well, okay. This might be the end, but maybe God's up to something. I don't know. It doesn't tell us. All we know is that he was there and what was taking place. To begin with, there were many believers were praying for him. And it kept, and they kept it up day and night for a week. Praying for Peter. 
And this helped to bring him peace. Peter probably wasn't aware they were praying. But see, somebody reached God, so peace was able to reach Peter. Man. Are y'all seeing this? You seeing how this is playing out? See, prayer was a way of reminding us Prayer has a way of reminding us of the promises of God's word, such as, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep, for thou, Lord, only makest me dwell in safety. Psalms 4, 8. So, or fear not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy, I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right, with the right hand of my righteousness. See, the main cause of Peter's peace was the knowledge that Herod could not kill him. I don't know, y'all. I'm just getting excited about this. Here's this man. Just, this, everybody just knows this man's doomed for death. But Jesus had promised Peter that he would live to be an old man and end his life crucified on a Roman cross. Peter understood I, it's been said over me that I'm not going to die at the hands of Herod. I'm going to die on an upside-down cross. Or on a cross. I think it was Andrew that was upside down. But Peter simply laid hold of that promise and committed the entire situation to the Lord, and he gave him peace and rest. He did not know how or when God would deliver him, but he did know that deliverance was coming. Peter was upside down. He said, I'm not worthy to be hung like my Lord. So Andrew was on the X cross, that's right. Peter was upside down. So, God, you delivered me once. You delivered me twice. This situation is different. I don't have anybody to preach to. Now, the Roman guards, he probably could have, but th this situation is, James has been killed, my, my, my friend, my colleague, my, my, you know, my ministry partner, and now they've taken John, it, it same, you know, away, and, and here I am in prison again, but I know, I have this confidence that you're going to deliver me. I don't know when, I don't know how, I just know you are. I think we need to have that boldness and that kind of confidence. I don't know when, I don't know how, but I know God will. And I do know he can. I still remind Gene what God spoke to me up here at this altar several years ago. There's going to be a miracle in that lady's life, and it's not these three children. It may be a part of it. But she's going to be healed with her disease. Now, I told her, I said, Gene, he might heal you here so we can see it, or he might heal you when you step to the gates. <laughs> Tracy, don't do that. I think, I think it's a mic. It's time for a new one. I found one for $1,500. I think I'm going to buy it. <laughs> Listen. He knew deliverance was coming. Peter was obeying in verses 7 through 11. See, once again, we behold the ministry of angels and are reminded that their angels care for God's children. The angel brought light and liberty into the prison cell, but the guards had no idea that anything was going on. Do you understand the situation? There's, he's chained to two Roman guards. And the angel comes in and light fills the room. But the only person that knows it is Peter, but he's asleep. He didn't, he didn't. Listen, you can turn the light on in my bedroom and I'm going to wake up. Even if I'm dead asleep. Peter had no idea. The angel, they brought the light in. However, Peter was going if Peter was going to be delivered, he had to obey what the angel commanded. He probably thought it was a dream or a vision. I'm seeing something. I'm dreaming this. 
But he arose and followed the angel out of the prison into the street. Only then did he come to himself and realize that there had been, that he had been part of another miracle. I love what it said in the text where it said that they went to the iron gate that led out to the street and it opened by itself. He wasn't supposed to get out of that jail. And nowhere in Scripture does it say anything. And my mind has to go and go deeper into this thing and starts wondering, how did the guards not know he wasn't chained to them anymore? Did the, did the angel just chain them to each other? And they thought they were chained to Peter? I don't know. It makes me stop and think. But all of a sudden, he, he's outside and he comes to himself and he realizes that he delivered me again. See, the angel commanded Peter to bind his garments with his girdle and then to put on his sandals. There were certainly ordinary tasks to do while a miracle was taking place. But God often joins the miraculous with the ordinary just to encourage us to keep it in balance. Jesus multiplied the loaves, the fishes, but then commanded his disciples to gather up the leftovers. He raised Josiah's daughter from the dead. He told her parents to give her something to eat. Even in miracles, God is always practical. See, God alone can do the extraordinary, but his people must do the ordinary. I preached the message many, many years ago, from ordinary to extraordinary. Daniel was just a young kid when he got called but yet he led a whole nation to God Moses was a basket case literally <laughs> but he led the children of Israel to the promise or to, to the edge of the promised land God does extraordinary things but he uses ordinary people to get it accomplished God alone can do it, but Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, but the men had to roll the stone from the tomb. Because when Jesus got there, he said, move that stone. And then he said, Lazarus, come forth. Why did he call Lazarus? Because if he had just said, come forth, everybody did would have got out of the grave. And he wasn't there to call everybody. He just wanted Lazarus. I just, that's what I believe. So it still took ordinary people. It took just men to move the stone. The angel came, the angel, the same angel that removed the chains from Peter's hands could have, could have put the shoes on Peter's feet, but he told Peter to do it. God never wastes miracles. Peter had to stop, had to stoop before he could walk. It was, it was, a good lesson in humility and in obedience. In fact, from that night on, every time Peter put on his shoes, it must have been a reminder of him, the prison miracle, and encouraged him to trust the Lord. Can I add something to this? I think it's the illustrated sermon. That's why I do illustrated sermons. When I gave out the keys, there's people that still tell me, I had to get my keys the other day, Pastor. I don't do it to be comical or to be funny. I do it so it, it will get you. The day that I had the loaf, the bread up here, and I was talking about the house of God being a house of bread, I was throwing pieces of bread out. And I guarantee you, every, and there was one boy that I hit right there, and every time I see him, he reminds me, you know you hit me with bread? I said, I was trying to hit you with the word. But the point is, is the, People remember those things. Every time he put his sandals on, he probably thought, oh, I remember the last time I did this, or I remember that time I did this when the angel told me to. It would have been cool for the angel to put him on and dress him and take him out and set him in the ground and then leave and Peter wake up. There. Yeah, that would have been nice. But he had, Peter had to do, be obedient to the things for his miracle to take place. See, the deliverance took place at Passover season, the time of year when the Jews celebrated their exodus from Egypt. 
The word delivered in Acts 12, 11 is the same word Stephen used when he spoke about the Jewish exodus. Peter experienced a new kind of exodus in an answer to the prayers of God's people. In verses 12 through 16, Peter was knocking. As, as Peter followed the angel, God opened the way. And when Peter was free, the angel vanished. His work was done, and now it was up to Peter to trust the Lord and use his common sense in taking the next step. You see, the prayers of God's people that had helped set him free, Peter decided that the best place for him would be in that prayer meeting at Mary's house. The best place I can go now, I just got freed from prison, is go to where the prayer meeting is. Furthermore, he wanted to report the good news that God had answered their prayers. So Peter headed to the house of Mary, mother of John Mark. When, if you remember, that many people were praying. They were praying earnestly. They, were pr they prayed night and day, and it said for probably a week. And their prayers were centered directly on Peter's deliverance. Then the scene that is described here is almost, it's almost comical. The answer to their prayers is standing at the door. But they, have, they don't have enough faith to even open the door. They're praying for the man to be freed, right? Deliver him, Lord. Lord, set Peter free. Oh, Lord, we're just praying over Peter. Lord, set him free. They're praying day and night for a week. And it's Peter's voice. What do we do? What did you pray for? It is like come. They don't, they, they didn't want to let him in. So God, God could get Peter out of prison, but he couldn't get himself into a prayer meeting. God delivered me from, from prison, but I can't even get in the prayer meeting where they pray me out at. Listen, the knock at the door might have been that of Herod's soldiers coming to arrest more believers. They, you know, they don't know. It took courage for, the, for her, for Rhoda, to, to go to the door. But imagine her surprise when she recognized Peter's voice. She was overcome that she forgot to open the door. I think she was just overwhelmed that God had answered, and then here he is standing at the door that she forgot to let him in. But Peter had to keep knocking and calling while the believers and the prayer meeting decided to do what? Decided what to do. What do we do? We let him in? Is that, a, is that, his, is that, is that his spirit? Is that his angel? The longer he stood at the gate, the more dangerous the situation became. As long as he's outside and can't get in, they can take, arrest him again. The exclamation they said, it's his angel, reveals that their belief in guardian angels. I believe we have an angel watching over us. I really do. I know we have the Holy Spirit. I know, we, I, I know that. But I do believe there's an angel set to guard you. And they, they, they believed in it as well. Of course, the logical question is, why would an angel bother to knock on the door? <laughs> all they had to do was simply walk. All he had to do was walk right in. But sad to say, good theology plus unbelief often leads to fear and confusion. Hear that? Good theology plus unbelief often leads to fear and confusion. Um, yeah. We must face the fact that even in the most favorite prayer meetings, there is sometimes a spirit of doubt and unbelief. We can have one of the best prayer meetings in this building. You can feel the Spirit of God moving, but there could be unbelief and doubt in the room. We are like the Father who cried to Jesus, Lord, I believe, help thou my, my unbelief. 
these Jerusalem saints believed that God could answer their prayer, so they kept at, kept at it night and day. But when the answer came right to their door, they refused to believe it. There may have been someone that said that they were deciding what to do. Do we open the door? What do we do? There may have been some that was doubting that even it was even possible for Peter to be knocking on the door. You see, back then they didn't have a peephole to look through to see who was out there. She said she heard his voice. She knew it was Peter. She heard the voice. But here they are deciding what do we do? Maybe, maybe there's doubt. It can't be Peter. We've only been praying for a certain amount of time. It can't be Peter. God graciously honors even the weakest faith. But how much more he would do if only we would trust him? This has nothing to do with tonight. But I saw this today at the bank, and I got to say it because if I don't, I'll forget it. A lady at the teller on her, on the, on her little sidewall she has all these scripture verses and stuff. She had a little saying, and it said, they say that if you, talk in, if you talk nice to a plant, it will grow. What would happen if we did that to people? I said, can I have that? She goes, no, I can't give that away. I said, I need to take a picture of it. She goes, okay, when you come back in here, I'll have it ready, and you can take a picture of it. Because I want to I get it, I want to print it out, and I want to hang it on my wall. We'll talk to a cactus, encourage it, I'm going to leave it right there. Let me finish. Let me get to the stopping point. The plural nouns in Acts 12, 16, it says, they opened the door and they were astonished. I get the impression that, that for safety's sake, they decided to open the door together and face together whatever might be on the other side of the door. Still had doubt. Opening the door, still thinking, is this, the soldiers, is this the guards? Are they, you know, is this the people who are going to come arrest us? They're going to come get some more of us. Has Peter been killed yet? Is he even alive? Rhoda would have done it by herself, but she was too overcome with joy. It's commendable that a lowly servant girl recognized Peter's voice and rejoiced that he was free. All she was was a maid, basically. She just took care of the place. She Surely, she was a believer who knew Peter as a friend. So verse 17, Peter was declaring, he's apparently everybody began to speak at once and Peter had to silence them. He quickly gave an account of the miracle of his deliverance and in no doubt thanked them for their prayers and for their help. He instructed them to get the word to James, the half-brother of the Lord, who was the leader of Jerusalem assembly. James, who was also the author of the epistle James. Not the one that was beheaded, but this one. While Peter, where Peter went, when he went and when he went and when he left the meeting, nobody knows to this day where he went to. It's not recorded. It certainly was a well kept secret, except for a brief appearance in Acts chapter fifteen. Peter walks off the pages of the book of Acts to make room for Paul and the story of his ministry along among the Gentiles. First Corinthians nine five tells us that Peter traveled in ministry with his wife. And in 1 Corinthians 1.12 suggests that he visited Corinth. There is no evidence in Scripture that Peter ever visited Rome. In fact, if Peter had founded the church in Rome, it's unlikely that Paul would have gone there for his policy was to work where, the, where other apostles had not labored. So certainly, also, he will certainly would have said something to or about Peter when he wrote his letter to the Roman church. Before we, leave, before we leave this area, you need to consider how Christians can best pray for those in prison. For even today, there are many people in prison only because they are Christians. I don't mean physical prison. There are a lot of people in prison in themselves. I preached a message one time called the Otis Effect. There are many Christians. Remember Otis from Andy Griffith? He walked in drunk. He'd get the key, he'd open the jail, he'd 
reach out there and hang the key back up. There's so many Christians that's in prison with the key hanging outside the door, they don't have the sense to unlock the door. It's the Otis effect. Remember, you need to remember them that are in bondage as we were in bondage at one time. Hebrews 13, 3 says that. In other words, we need to pray for them as you would want them to pray for you if you and your situation was reversed. We ought to pray that God will give them grace to bear with suffering so that they might have a triumphant witness for the Lord. We should ask the Spirit to minister the Word to them and to bring them to remembrance, to bring to their remembrance. It's, it is right to ask God to protect his own and to give them wisdom as they, as they must day after day deal with difficult en- enemies. See, we can ask God if, if it, that if it's his will, they be delivered from their bondage and suffering and reunited with their loved ones. It could be a physical prison. It could be a spiritual prison. There are many that are bound. There are many that I need to get a pen. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This story of Peter is, is pretty fascinating. But it, it, it reflects back to, it, really, it, it, it kind of comes to, to the end to where it reflects on us. <laughs> on praying for those that are in bondage, praying for those that are in need, praying for those that, that, that need hope. You know, I, I know, I know Peter was in a physical prison. I, I get that. And, 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 you know, we need to pray for those. But there are a lot of people that are in spiritual prison that I think are forgotten about sometimes. And I think a lot of times, <laughs> it's even to the point that, man, why do I think of things to say and I can't say them or shouldn't say them? But then I say them anyway. A lot of times, people have this mentality. Ha. They put themselves there. I don't care how they got there. They need to get out. And in, re- in reality, you could say that Peter got arrested on his own because he was told not to do something, he did it anyway. But he was obeying God. It's not, it's not always the fact that people choose to be where they are, spiritually, whatever. Sometimes it, it's, they, they, got put, they, they, they got forced there, or maybe they did put themselves there. But is it is this because they, does that mean, okay, well, we skip you and go, no. That's what he's trying to say here. Um, this Acts 11, we'll probably, we'll probably finish it next week, honestly. Because um, it, it's not really, it's not a lot, a lot of detail. It, it, mainly this, this first part was probably the really exciting part. I mean, it's all good, but. We'll, uh, we'll continue this next week, and we'll, we'll find out and move on. As you heard me say in Acts 15, we kind of, Peter kind of disappears, and Paul steps in, and Paul's on the scene. So, But we do know that in the end, Peter was crucified up, upside down as a disciple. Um, one of the disciples said was, was beat with a club, and then drug down steps by his feet. Andrew was hung on an cro- uh, X cross. <sighs> He's got suffered horrible deaths for the cause of Christ. And as, you, as, you, as we read about Peter, we read about Paul, imprisonment was... was where they were placed to try to shut them up. 
but it didn't work. It didn't work. Herod had a plan three times, and all three of them failed. Paul was left shipwrecked. He was whipped with a cat of nine tails minus one strike three times. Left in a, you know, just wrecked and even wrote to Timothy and said, you know, my handwriting, my eyes ain't what they used to be, so excuse my handwriting, basically. But still managed to Get stuck away on an island, deserted from everybody. So God could say, hey, I need you to write one more letter. And we're going to close this thing out. And he wrote Revelation. Um, read Acts 12, 18 through the end of the chapter this next, next week sometime. Uh, don't forget Sunday is our stage or week two of our missions. Jonathan Brown from Savannah is going to be here, going to share a lot of great things that's going on. Um, I'm going to be getting with him, uh, probably not Sunday, but getting with him about something for next year of taking a, a group of people to Savannah and doing some, some missionary work. Um, they did get a church building, and it's got, it's got kitchen, it's got housing, it's got everything that they need to do it's the perfect place. It really is. So, and I'm sure he'll share some upgrades on that, some things that they've done. So, uh, but would you stand? We'll let you get out of here. Thanks for coming. Be in prayer for Sunday. Be in prayer for Jonathan as he travels. Just be in prayer for our service, um, that God will use him and, and speak to our hearts. I, I know we, I know it, it kind of looks you know, like, okay, Pastor, this, this month is just all about money. It's really not. It's all about making yourself available to be part of what God's doing. That's really what it is. And I just want you to hear from the missionaries that we support um, financially, prayerfully, what's going on, what's happening in their lives, what's happening in their ministry. I don't want you to think that we're just dumping money into somewhere and nobody's doing nothing. These people are working diligently. For the, for the kingdom, and, and they're changing lives. The lives are being changed. Uh, these people have been in Savannah for over 25 years, and they did it many times going building to building, place to place. They did it without a van. They did it without help, without volunteers. But they got called there, and he stuck to his call, and he's reaping the harvest now. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your word. I pray, God, that it encourages us, that it strengthens us, that it empowers us. I pray, Lord, that we understand, really, the power of prayer and the effects of prayer. And, Lord, I pray that you go with us the rest of this week. Bless your people. Lord, just protect them. Lord, those that are sick, those that couldn't be here, God, bless them, touch them, heal them. Those that we prayed for, Lord, already, we just lift them back up. God, and just meet every need that needs to be met. We'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. See you Sunday at 9.30.